So thanks everyone for coming. I know there's still a few people grabbing food. Feel free to grab snacks and make your way to the table when you can. Shannon is at the three minute mark past two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Um, I'll just start um, today's event. My name is Zad Derek Gamal Joseph. Um, I'm a member of Klaus the Nation. I work at the Indigenous Service Department and we're really excited today to be part of the diversity circles and have you part of the event today as voices within gender and at BCIT. Um, the way we look and the way I've looked and always view gender is I come from a matriarchal family, a matriarchal line. So when I talk about my family, I look to the oldest female within my KO, within my trap line, within my village, and that's my Aunt Bernie. And I, I get to talk about her and how she's led our, our KO and our, our, our family for some time now. And she's followed that lineage and I followed that tradition um, throughout my life. So it's, it's, oh, I always get that nice little reminder of who's in charge when I go up north. So it's always good to have when I mention my grandpa or my uncle or, or others. It's always my Aunt Bernie who brings me back to that center. Um, so as you see, our title today is Student Voices, Gender and BCIT. And we're very happy and we're very lucky to have such a great lineup of speakers. And we really are happy that everyone was able to make it today. Um, I want to start by calling up, uh, well, I'll start today by just reminding the, the audience of just how we're interacting today at our tables, how we're looking to respect each other and how we're looking to avoid jargon and other terms or, or pieces that may be harmful to other, each other. Um, we're looking at uh, respecting one another and keeping really where we're at and what we're at and our conversations um, confidential at the table without names. So for moving forward and, and discussing this, we're not bringing up X said this, Y said that. We're, we're discussing it in, a, in an informal, uh, anonymous way. We have the pleasure of having Aureen Askew, uh, AKA DJ Osho, here, and I'm going to ask Aureen to come up. Uh, she's a member of Squamish Nation. She's on the council uh, within the nation, and I'm, uh, we're lucky to ask her to come up and do the welcome for us today. Aureen. Hot squile tenoya skohamish oslahan okumeoch, Aureen askew kuyensna, chinwa DJ Osho, Chinua spokesperson, uh, Squamish Nation Council. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aureen Askew, and I'm from the Squamish Nation. I wear about five different hats. Uh, I'm a spokesperson for Squamish Nation Council, along with uh, my partner in crime. You've probably heard of him, Kel Salem. He's on the news uh, almost every day. <laughs> but I want to welcome you to the shared territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I'm also a DJ, I have my own business. I've been in business for about seven years now. And I actually graduated from the radio broadcasting program here at BCIT about 10 years ago. So it's, uh, it's definitely helped. And I'll get more into that when I speak later. I don't wanna give it all away right now. But I wanted to formally welcome everyone to our territory. And I appreciate how you're doing the proper protocols of our people. Um, yeah, so thank you. And I think uh, it's gonna be a great panel this afternoon. So I'll see you. Masih Arian. Um, I'd just like to also recognize some of the members in the room that are really leading the charge with respect, diversity, and inclusion. We have our new associate director, Shireen, in the back there. And also always keeping a positive and reflective lens, uh, our VP of marketing, that's Lara. And the organizing team, which you'll see and meet throughout the day. Well, actually, see, I see Donna there as well. She's a registrar. I might as well give her props while she's standing up. <laughs> I was calling people on it. Um, but with, well, without further ado, I'll uh, welcome up our MC, uh, Micah Fox. He's a BBA alumni, is a current uh, um, employee at the First Nations Health Authority, and is a member of the Quinlan Dunn First Nation. Well, 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, I'm super thankful to be working and conducting this good work on the Squamish Nation, Musqueam, and Slay with Two Territories. So I hold my hands up to um, all of the lands of the people around us. Um, thank you to BCI teams on the Indigenous um, Department for organizing this, and along with the Events Department, really appreciated. Um, obviously, the, the discussions that we talked about today um, are something that's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all the different panelists today and hearing what they have to provide some of their information. Um, a bit about me, my name is Micah Fox. Um, I was born in the Yukon Territory. I'm from Kuala Dun First Nation. Um, I also, like Zah, grew up in a matriarchal family. I was raised by my mother and my grandmother, so very strong women around me um, quite often. <laughs> so that's very good for myself. Um, I am a graduate of BCIT. I did my um, marketing management event diploma here. Loved it so much, couldn't get enough, had to do the BBA, so that was great. Um, and the Indigenous services were a really strong part of um, developing who I was as a student and as a young man, and now as a professional. I work at the First Nations Health Authority. I'm the manager of travel and business support there, where I get to interact and visit our community members, the 204 First Nations throughout BC on a yearly basis. So I'm really I'm grateful and thankful. Um, up next, I would like to invite up Trina Prince. She's the event manager for BCIT Student Association, and um, I'll let her take it away on her own. Awesome, thanks, Micah. Everyone can hear me, we're good? In the back there? Awesome, sounds good. So there's a little introduction of myself up here, which I really appreciate. Um, and I'm just really going to try and be as quick as I can, but I'm gonna to talk to you about Pronouns 101. Um, I think it's really important to kind of open, and I, when we were talking about what we wanted to do today, um, I'm not a student BCIT, and I really want to acknowledge that. I am a staff member with the Student Association, so I work closely with students. And I've attended a lot of these amazing diversity circles, and I think it's really important to be attending them, to be learning, and to be growing. And with them, we have these wonderful little name tags that get handed out. And sometimes I often see that the pronoun par portion isn't filled in. So I'm going to kind of do a little bit of pronouns one-on-one -on -one and why it's important to fill that in, and what's the reason why we're here. Um, first and foremost, I really want to acknowledge that throughout history, throughout different cultures, throughout different um, ways of living, there's actually been multi-genders within multiple different cultures and ways that folks live. Talking about multiple genders, uh, non-binary, two-spirit, trans folks has always been a part of history, um, but due to colonization this has been erased and very much the European binary system has been introduced. So I really want to acknowledge that this is not a new concept today, it's just we're reintroducing it to learn better and to understand what we can do to uh, make this world a better place for everybody and make it more um, inclusive. So. Um, I do use they, them pronouns. I identify as trans non-binary. I am a white European settler here on um, Musqueam, Squamish, and Slow Tooth Nations, and I always like to acknowledge that, of course. Um, many of the items that I'm going to be talking about today um, very quickly come from Law Donnelly's article called Pronouns One on One. It's already out there. I appreciate that I was able to build off of their work, as well as some work that Community has done, WAVA, um, as well as my own lived experience. So pronouns, what are they? Um, hang on. Haha. <laughs> pronouns. So pronouns are the words we use to refer to a person when we aren't using their name. Happens every single day. Um, happens to people introducing each other, talking about each other. Um, and these are little words that, such as they, she, her, z, her, here, and zay. Um, it can make a big difference in creating a safe space for many different people. I may have introduced some new pronouns that you folks might not know, but it's very important to learn that there's multiple different pronouns that are being introduced. Um, and it's really important that living a life where people get your pronouns right isn't necessarily everyone's experience. I am misgendered on a daily basis. Um, it's something that we're slowly working through. Uh, when I first started working at BCIT six years ago, um, I did identify and was using pronouns she, her. So as I'm introducing the fact that I now use they, them pronouns, it is uh, a conversation I'm continually having with people, which I think is really important to acknowledge. Um, so it's really, really important to be asking and correctly using someone's pronouns in the easiest way. It's the easiest way to be more respectful. So when I talk about pronouns, people always are like, so when you're introducing these new pronouns, can you let me know examples? And so I think it's really important. So I always like to go with pronouns such as, so as I mentioned, she and her are the gendered pronouns that are used kind of, that people are more typically aware of and more um, common. Um, and she is typically used by a person who is more feminine, identifies as female, um, and then he is obviously by those who identify as male. 
Not necessarily always, though. I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And so it's really important to understand what pronouns people use. Um, and they is an example of gender neutral pronouns, as well as Z and A and here are also commonly used um, for folks who may identify as non-binary, trans, gender queer, gender non-conforming, et cetera. So some examples. So I met Peyton on the bus, and she helped me find my seat. I met Peyton on the bus, and he helped me find my seat. I met Peyton on the bus, and they helped me find my seat. So those are examples of how we can learn and use the different pronouns that are introduced. Um, I met Peyton on the bus, and here helped me find my seat. There's many different ways that these may be used. So I really found this amazing chart, which I thought was really helpful, um, and it shows some of the examples that may exist to help folks understand the different ways that these pronouns might be used. For some folks, I usually, when I'm having this conversation about pronouns, I'm just taking a check, um, many of them may come back to me like, well, they, them, pronoun has been introduced to me as a plural usage. And I'm going to kind of jump in right away and say that they um, has always been used as a singular pronoun since the 1300s. Shakespeare's a really good example of this. Um, and so it's something also that Merriam Webster's dictionary has introduced recently as a singular term. It's been clarified as such. And I think it's really important to acknowledge those pieces. Um, and so also, if that is something that's challenging, maybe that's how you learned to use they, them was plural. Trying to be a little awkward, trying to even figure out and learn past that can be, do a heck of a lot for folks who that's their pronouns and make them feel comfortable. So I think that's really important to kind of point out. So why are pronouns so important? So when a trans, gender diverse, or non-binary person comes out, there's often a lot of consideration that has gone into what pronouns they identify with. It took me quite some time to figure out this was the pronouns that I wanted to use, was they, them. And I think it's so important to connect that and understand why that's something that feels so comfortable. For me, I've never felt my whole life, I've never felt female or male. I've always kind of felt somewhere in between and somewhere not at all. Um, and so when I got introduced to the concept of non-binary, it took some while for me to get comfortable with that because I was concerned of what other people might think. But then now that I've actually come out and I've been like, this is, these are my pronouns, it feels absolutely amazing and it's such a breath of fresh air for me. And so I think it's really important to keep these conversations going and keep talking about pronouns. I mentioned earlier that mis I'm constantly misgendered. I know, unfortunately, a lot of folks are. And so misgendering, just to clarify, is when someone refers to another person using the wrong pronouns, either on purpose or by accident. For me, I think most folks accidentally misgender me, um, but it can make the person feel disrespected, disrespected, stressed, and not welcome in that space. So it's so important to take the time to learn how to be a better ally, learn how to um, understand pronouns, and just have these conversations where we can be open and understanding and, and inclusive. Um, so how to be an ally, or how to be someone who wants to expand and learn more. I always say when talking about pronouns, ask them. Never assume, assume someone's pronouns. Um, everyone, of course, is encouraged to be themselves. And folks may represent or present themselves very feminine, very masculine, androgynous, somewhere in between, doesn't really matter, somewhere completely out of that spectrum. Um, we are raised in understanding two boxes, which are pink and blue. But I'd love for everyone to try and kind of forget that when it comes to gender. And so never assume someone's pronouns when you're meeting them. So it doesn't matter what their voice may sound like or what they look like. It's always important to um, ask what someone's pronouns may be. And so I think it's really important when asking, I usually like to also add consent into that as well. Don't just, you know, be like, what are your pronouns? Um, I always like to say something like, may I ask you what your pronouns are? Are you okay if we do a pronoun check-in? Or, hey, I'm Trina, my pronouns are they, them, what are yours? And it just builds that safe space for those people to feel comfortable. I definitely have met a number of folks that are like, I've never done a pronoun check-in before, or I've never been asked this before. And then I take that opportunity to have some education with them and to have that conversation about how we're moving away from just the binary pronouns and that there's many ways that folks may identify with their pronouns. Um, also, it's not always necessarily might be the same, the right space to be asking for those pronouns, and also understand that people's gender are their own identities, and you don't always have to know that. And so definitely gauge the space and get to know the understanding to make sure that it's the right time to be asking for someone's pronouns as well. Um, 
we're gonna, very shortly, we're gonna do an activity in two seconds. When we do that activity, the pronoun um, name tags are gonna be handed out as well. We kind of actually didn't put them on the tables right away. We'll be doing that in a second. And so with that, some ways that you can also learn to be an ally is by making sure that you are on your name tags including your pronouns. Um, it shows that it's a safer space. It shows that people understand um, what pronouns are and that you, they understand that there are all multiple uh, pronouns that may be used. Um, and this can also be really helpful on email. Um, taglines as well. I think it's really important within your email if you also include your pronouns. I, I know that I can also then uh, talk to that person about using they them pronouns or other pronouns as well because they have a better understanding when I see that um, in someone's email. It, it does create that safer space. Um, when you accidentally misgender someone, it does happen. Don't over apologize. Because what I find with over apologizing, it may cause that person to feel uncomfortable. It may bring more attention to it. What I do when I accidentally use the wrong name or misgender someone, um, use the wrong pronoun, I do it to myself still sometimes. Uh, 28 years of thinking that I'm more feminine than I am is, uh, is something to unlearn even in myself. And so what I do is when I misgender um, someone or I maybe say the wrong uh, pronoun while I'm talking about someone, um, I would correct myself. So I might be saying a sentence being like, oh, I was hanging out with Joshua and he was helping me with this and then oh actually I was hanging out with Joshua and they were helping me with this and I'd actually just repeat the sentence because it's training my brain and it's also correcting myself in front of the people um, and it's also an apology. If Joshua was in the room I would talk to them and apologize to them directly and say I'm really sorry um, afterwards. Um, uh, thanks for you know creating that space. I hope you're okay. Um, so really kind of take that awareness that when you do make mistakes, have a simple sorry, but keep moving forward and acknowledging that you're doing your very best um, and work on, on that training. Um, and I also like to remind folks, I've definitely overheard where like in the space with me, they use they, them pronouns, but externally with other groups, they'll use she, her. Um, and so always try and keep that reminder that even in other spaces where I may not be present, um, well, not me, but other folks may not be present, use the correct pronouns for the ones that they've identified as um, to create that space and to uh, allow other folks to also learn that those are the pronouns that they're using. Um, and of course, lots more can be found online. Um, I do encourage you to do some extra research. research. Uh, BCAT Pride, the committee has done a lot of work, which is really neat, and we do have our own web page. Um, the easiest way to find it is if you just go to BCAT's main site under the search engine, just type in Pride, and it'll be the first thing that pops up. It's a Commons page, um, and there's lots of resources on there that can help you continue learning. Um, and of course, practice, practice, practice. My partner and I, um, for me, when I was first introducing they, them to myself, as well as just learning about it uh, about four or five years ago. Um, what we did is anyone we met, we immediately, of course, didn't assume their gender and we would practice. So like, um, or a waiter was fantastic, they helped us with this, um, we didn't assume their gender and so things like that. So by practicing and creating those spaces from the very, and by centering they, them, or centering you know, um, gender neutral pronouns, you're immediately creating safer spaces for everybody um, until you learn otherwise. So that's what we do to practice, and it's really, really helpful. Um, so with that, I've got a fun little activity. We're gonna, okay, I took a little bit more time than I meant to. I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna take um, three minutes, and just within your tables or to the person next to you, what I'd love for you to do, so this is a really good example of some being mindful of some language. Um, so there's this one, this is on the community's webpage, which is really great. Um, so instead of saying ladies, gentlemen, welcome, uh, ma'am, sir, you can think about things like friends, folks, hi everyone, how are you, things like that. Um, and then an activity that I'd like you to do is just have a conversation about what took place over the weekend or what's gonna happen, something that you're comfortable talking about. But while you're having that conversation, using all gender inclusive language. So using they, them pronouns or uh, he, uh, sorry, here, um, Z pronouns, um, depending on which pronouns you're comfortable with, but that use the gender inclusive um, pronouns, as well as think about the binary language that we live in. There's mom, dad, that could be parent, daughter, son, child, offspring, Nef niece and nephew, nibbling is a term that's been introduced, which I think is fantastic. Uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, could be partner or companion, uh, girl, boy, child or kid, Women, man, human, person, individual, and of course, guys, girls, ladies, gentlemen, could be everyone or folks. So just to have, turn to the person next to you and take maybe one minute each and just kind of quickly have a quick conversation about something that happened over the weekend, but try to stick with gender inclusive language. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much everyone, I really appreciate it. If anyone wants to carry on this conversation about pronouns, please reach out to me, I'm always happy to have a conversation. And now I will bring it back to Micah.
Well, I'd like to thank Trina for um, throwing us through that little bit of an exercise. She was saying that it's taken her years to, oh, sorry, they see, exactly. Uh, so I just did that just to show you. No. <laughs> they said that um, it, it has been taking, um, they, years to, I guess, perfect this. Even just during this little example, I caught myself so many times, and same with Za. We were talking about how we have been talking like this for so long, and we feel like we're pretty liberal, progressive people, that you, it's going to take practice, you know what I mean? So that's what we're here for. So thank you so much for giving us examples. And I have uh, beautiful little nibblings that are in town this weekend, which I was talking about. So I'm gonna love us utilizing that word quite a bit moving forward, so I appreciate that. Um, next, I would like to bring up Michaela Leon, and she's co-executive BCIT Women in Computing Club. So if you'd like to come on up, Michaela. Hello. Oh, I'm a bit short, so I'll have to <laughs> move this down. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm Michaela, and as... Um, presented here in the bio. I'm currently a club executive in the BCIT Women Computing Club. And today I'm here to talk about my experiences as a female student in a male-dominated program, specifically um, the CST program, as well how I was able to take those experiences and I was able to take action and be an agent of change around my uh, for, um, in my surroundings. So um, before um, coming into CSD, I already knew um, coming in, before coming in that um, it'll be, there will be a lot of uh, male identifying um, people who will make up most of my intake at least. And I found to be in, I found myself to be in the minority. And um, from that viewpoint, I, um, I told myself that hey, I'll get to know everyone, especially those who are females, uh, female students in my intake and I will, throughout the year. And so um, I was able to successfully get to know everyone, um, uh, everyone in my program, at least the, um, the, the female students, at least. And from that experience, um, I was able to look into it, and um, as the term progresses on, I found that um, a lot of students in my program are dropping out, and sorry, are dropping out, and I found um, that heartbreaking, especially when female students. Um, are the ones who are dropping out because um, we're already in the minority and it's just um, sad to see that your friends um, are slowly leaving the program that you are in. And so um, from that experience of seeing so many um, female students leave the program, I've thought to myself that what is it that makes them leave the program? Or perhaps um, do they get enough support? Or do they feel they're not welcome in this, um, in this environment? So this is why um, I got involved in the Women in Computing Club. Where in the Women in Computing Club, I organize um, events where f um, female students can connect with each other as well um, meet industry professionals. And through my involvement in the Women Computing Club, I gained experiences where um, I was able to look into my day-to-day -day, um, school, day-to-day um, -day life in school and see, see what else can I, I can help with or um, look into. And so I've been involved in some hackathons um, for those who may not know, hackathons are, um, are events where um, software developers are presented with a problem and we're supposed to make up a solution within a time period. And most of these hackathons, they are usually 
um, made up um, dominantly by men, or at least male identifying um, people. And in these hackathons, I usually found myself um, being, in, um, being in the minority, meaning that I'm all, it's either I'm always the um, only female in my, in my team, or, or it's either 50-50, it's half females, half males. And in, that, in those experiences, I found that, um, that, that maybe there could be an event that um, allows females to, um, to be able to experience what, what is it like to be in an all-female team. And so earlier this year, I was able to, to attend um, Command F, which is a all-female hackathon hosted at UBC, which to my surprise is the very first um, um, all-female hackathon held in Vancouver which is very surprising to me considering it's 2019 and the tech industry is already booming. And so when I attended that hackathon, it was the change, um, there was an obvious shift in atmosphere com in comparison to my other experiences and other hackathons. Whereas um, what, I mean, what I meant by that is that the atmosphere is very welcoming, I would say. Um, and why did I say welcoming? Because the, um, everyone there is just introducing themselves that, hey, I'm actually, I'm here to learn and I would like to meet people. It's not very competitive, um, which lessen off the pressure to those who are, um, to those who are in um, attending the event. And, and other than um, having a very welcoming atmosphere, um, during the presentations, um, so other than having a very welcoming atmosphere, um, we had to do project presentations where we, we were able to um, present our projects to the panel of judges. And during that uh, presentation time, what I found from the teams is that it, it Focus less on the um, the projects themselves, and it focus more on the teams who um, who said who all um, told everyone what they've learned, what they ex experienced, and they all thank the organizers for being able to um, hold such a wonderful event. And so, um, why am I telling you about my experiences as a female CST student, as well as my experiences from that all-female hackathon. Well, we all observe things, we all notice things, and it is only when we take actions and um, act upon those observations and be able to be our own agent of change, where we can actually make an impact in our surroundings and make our spaces more inclusive and welcoming. And that's everything. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Um, we appreciate your kind and humble words. It takes a lot of courage to come up here and to speak on behalf of uh, um, your circle, and um, yeah, we, I hold my hands up to you for that, so it took a lot of strength. No wonder why you started uh, becoming very active in your, in your club and moving that forward, so that's really great work that you're doing. Um, next, I would like to call up um, Sasha Karpov and BCIT part-time study student. Oh, hello, um, uh, my name is Sasha and my uh, pronouns are they, them, and uh, you can read the rest uh, information about me on uh, this beautiful slide. Um, so um, I've been asked to speak about my experience uh, as a non-binary trans person at BCIT, 
and I have a couple of experiences to share. Actually, can everyone hear me fine? Okay. Um, the first one is sort of funny. Um, during the first week at BCIT, uh, our instructor had a survey for us, and um, it, was, it had three options for gender. Uh, one was male, of course. Um, the second was female. Uh, and uh, the third option, ironically, was uh, prefer not to say. Well, um, why it is funny is because uh, non-binary people, people like myself, uh, usually have a lot to say about gender, so this was a really <laughs> wrong option. Um, so I, 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 so at the, during the class, I felt compelled to, to explain this to my instructor. Then I sent her an email during the class uh, with, the, with the link to uh, information about a new gender X uh, introduced in British Columbia. And I also um, introduced myself to, uh, to my classmates and told them that my pronouns were they, them. Uh, well, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the information was ignored, uh, but luckily, because I take a database course, the, the gender topic comes up quite a bit because it's one of the categories, one of the important categories that uh, the government or organization want, organizations want to collect. So it comes up every, it, and it gives me an opportunity to, uh, to shine and cast the light of knowledge. So, um, and, um, some students I hear uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Facebook that uh, uh, some parts of BCAT don't quite get that there are, even, uh, there are even more than one gender. They probably, you know, they, and three for them, it's like half of the infinity already. And you know, if you, if you combine like two threes and turn it on the side, that's the infinity symbol. So that's why I'm saying it's half the infinity. So, um, uh, whatever, whenever um, I interact with any organization, doesn't matter uh, which, which one, um, for, uh, it could be BCAT or it could be Starbucks or anything, there are a couple, a couple of good guidelines um, that I would love them to follow. And uh, the guidelines are very easy, uh, but they're not intuitive. They have to be learned, and that was... Uh, you know, a couple of other speakers said that already, that you have to learn that. Um, uh, first, I would like to see that the company um, or the organization is aware that uh, of the fact that there are more genders and sexes than just two. Um, then this, uh, so um, the second guideline is I would like to be treated in such a way that my gender uh, is not assumed based on what I look like or what is on my ID. So, um, uh, and uh, don't call me sir or ma'am. Um, you can just say hello. That's again, going back to gender neutral language. Uh, there's no need to gender me right away. Uh, and third, um, if a mistake is made about my identity, I should be able to correct it without it becoming a big deal. I don't want to speak to, I don't want to have to speak to a manager to explain, to explain myself and then spend half an hour uh, and behaving in a calm and pleasant manner. So um, at, at the moment, this is not just my wish uh, to be understood and accepted, uh, but it is also written in the law. Um, in 2016, that was about three years ago, I was present uh, in a meeting with the BC Attorney General where we discussed the importance of respecting gender identity and gender expression in British Columbia. And both terms, gender identity and gender expression, are used at the federal and the provincial level. And since 2016, so now it is 2019, um, and there are also non-discrimination laws that exist at both levels. However, turns out that creating a law is not enough. Uh, there has to, uh, it has to be implemented through policies, through regulations. Um, it's, it could be government policies, government regulations, it could be company policies. Uh, for example, it took the government of British Columbia uh, two years uh, to introduce the third gender. And uh, it wasn't just it didn't just appear magically on people's IDs. Actually, people had to go and had to sue the government and had to make sure that it happens. Um, and uh, until now, people with gender X uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot get uh, enhanced driver's licenses with their designation. So if you are gender X, 
you can only get a regular driver's license, not, no, not enhanced. Um, and uh, well, uh, it turns out that uh, when it comes to organizations like BCIT, it takes a little longer to implement these changes. Um, without, uh, pr uh, for example, um, I couldn't register uh, at BCA, uh, I couldn't register a BCAT account um, because I didn't want to provide my gender. Well, eventually I did, um, and there were only two available. Well, there were only two available options, male and female. Um, and um, in the past, I had the same experience with Douglas College. Douglas College were great about it. I just said, well, you know what, you don't have this option. They said, okay, fill out paper application, we'll just take it, we'll fill it out, that's it, that's done. Uh, with BCIT, I sent an email to, uh, to, B, uh, to student records, then um, I talked to other people, there's just, uh, just a wall of silence. Um, they either didn't understand my concern uh, that the third gender was absent or were just simply ignoring it, and uh, neither scenario was uh, acceptable. Um, and, um, you know, I thought that maybe for a person at BCAT Records, it was just something once in a lifetime thing that they didn't quite uh, maybe get it. Uh, but uh, but uh, then I reached out to students on campus and apparently I'm not the only one. I'm not the only non-binary person, a non-binary student. So so obviously it maybe it didn't, maybe it never came up before, I, which, I, which I doubt, but anyway, nothing was done. So, um, I, so, and I must admit, uh, because of my age, because I have a job, because of my employer, um, I work for uh, Immigrant Services Society of BC as a database coordinator. Uh, they they support me uh, because I have a partner. That's very important too. Because I have a roof over my head, I'm not homeless. Uh, because of my education, I have master's degree, and um, I'm able to risk not always being agreeable and nice or pleasant. Unlike, for example, a student who comes here, who has to have two jobs, who, who is afraid to speak out because their grades may, may be affected, and who doesn't, who doesn't have any other supports. Um, so that's why I, well, I, I'm glad that I'm able to speak at this event. Um, I approached three departments within BCIT, uh, the Respect, Diversity, and Inclusion Office, uh, BCIT Research Ethics Board, and Learning and uh, uh, Teaching Center. And in the end, I also had to contact the Ministry of Advanced Education, uh, who responded that the new gender options during registration should be available very soon. Um, well, we'll see if, if that happens. And I just wanted to thank uh, 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 Trina Prince and uh, Robin uh, Lohid and uh, helping me to find the, the right way up to that. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for giving some insight into your story. I really appreciate it. Um, next, we'd like to call up Megan Richardson, who is the Human Resources Manager at D-Wave Systems. Thank you so much for having me. So yes, as noted, I am not a BCIT student, so I really appreciate your time and attention. Um, I wanted to share um, basically just a little bit of information here uh, that is quite important in my line of work about implicitly gendered job ads. Um, we're just going to skip right past this because we already talked about me. Um, but yeah, so uh, in my role in human resources, we do a lot of thinking about the institutional pieces of organizations. Um, and I work in tech. In tech, uh, one of the areas where tech really struggles is with gender. Uh, and so how we are uh, welcoming people of diverse genders into our organizations is something that we think about a lot. Uh, and this particular research article uh, is something that is used quite commonly in my field to sort of support how do we write job ads in a way that is inclusive. Um, so just to kind of explain a little bit about what exactly this is. So this is a research article that was published by Goucher, Frazen, and Kay in 2011. Um, and effectively what they did was they looked at a couple different things with regards to gendered language in advertisements. Um, like any research article, there are absolute limitations. For example, you'll notice that this deals with gender as a binary, so it just talks about male and female, um, which as we're all aware is not reflective of uh, sort of the global experience of gender uh, or the individual experience of gender. Um, but nonetheless, this is sort of the limitation of this particular study. 
Um, and essentially what they did is they both looked at existing job ads as well as created their own. And they looked at jobs that are mostly dominated by um, or mostly staffed by male individuals. So uh, they found like plumbers, electrician, uh, engineer. Uh, jobs that were mostly held by uh, women or feminine in identifying individuals, uh, early childhood educator, nurses, um, roles like this. And then they also looked at jobs that were very, very balanced. So for example, a uh, real estate agent, very, uh, very mixed in terms of gender. And they found that um, they found a couple different things. So part of it was that when they looked at jobs that were primarily held um, by men, they found that very masculine language was very, very common in these ads. Um, and these are language that is absolutely like more a stereotype, so uh, very agenic language, aggressive language, achievement-oriented language. Uh, and they found that um, when you looked at those kinds of jobs, that kind of language was very, very present. And so they're like, okay, well, what kind of effect does that have when people actually read those job ads. So they put together examples, and I have some examples of what they put together on this slide. I don't know if you can read it, um, but we have a, a little handout with an example of that as well. And they presented that to people. And they found that when we use this very macho wording, readers do estimate that there's a higher percentage of men in the company for that job. Um, and that's regardless of if it's a job that is traditionally held mostly by women, or a job that's traditionally held mostly by men, or a mixed job. Um, they also found that the people who were reading them who identified as women found those jobs less appealing. And they're like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder why. And they did ask about skill. And it's not that those individuals found, thought that they would be less qualified or less skilled in the job, but rather that they anticipated less belonging in that position. They didn't feel like they'd be welcomed and able to contribute those skills. Um, and so from in my profession, when we're writing these things, this is something that we have to keep in mind. How are we presenting ourselves to potential candidates? And in what ways are we potentially sustaining existing inequalities? Um, so I do have a little bit of a handout, which is somewhere, I think. Um, yes. So I want to just invite you all to take a look through that, um, take a read through, and then in your tables, share a little bit about how that job ad makes you feel. What is your impression of that company, of that job? If you had those skills, is that a place that you would want to work? Why or, or why not? Um, and, and what kind of things are maybe missing in that job ad or what kind of things could be changed? All right. So you're welcome to keep those. Uh, I'm going to be a table afterwards if you want to keep, uh, if you want to discuss sort of this kind of stuff further because I think it's fascinating. Um, if this is something that's maybe part of your role, there are some free tools that can help you sort of um, look at what kind of maybe unconsciously biasing language uh, your job ad or any sort of text is using. Uh, and I'm going to go sit down. Thank you, Megan. Really appreciate it. Um, ironically enough, I was just um, last week rewriting two job descriptions for two new roles, and now I'm like, oh, do I need to go back to HR now and kind of review them? <laughs> to kind of, you gave me uh, quite a bit to think about, so I'm going to actually use that in a practical application when I get back to the office later today. So thanks, Megan. <laughs> I'll get your email, so in case I need some tips. <laughs> Next, I'd like to call up Aureen Askew. She's um, a chief and council member from Squamish Nation, and as well as a recognized DJ. And she's also going to be DJing at Indigenous Fashion Week this week, so shout out to her. Come on up. <laughs> they want to speak too. I'll introduce myself again. Halt, Squile, Tenoya, Skohamish, Oslohan, Okameoch, Orin Askew, Queen Sna, Chinwa, DJ Osho. Hello, everybody. My name is Orin Askew. I'm from the Squamish Nation. I am also known as DJ Osho. It says on my hat. Um, I did graduate here from here 10 years ago, and uh, it's, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, by the way, as well. Um, one experience I had here, uh, we were watching the election uh, when Barack Obama got in. Uh, a bunch of us were at the pub. This is 2008, I believe. But it was so interesting because after he won the election, we were walking around campus and people were 
hugging me <laughs> and say, <laughs> saying congratulations um, because I am mixed heritage so I've got basically four spirits inside of me so I'm from the Squamish Nation, I'm African American, um, my roots stem back from Gary, Indiana. Does anyone know what Gary, Indiana is kind of famous for? Uh, that's the Jackson family. So my grandmother's house is around the corner from the Jackson family's house where they grew up. So I was just there actually back in September. So really cool history about music. And then I'm Two-Spirited. And it's interesting um, how far-fetched I believe it's come uh, to actually saying I'm Two-Spirited. Like I wasn't really comfortable with saying that because people, um, a lot of people don't know what it means, right? And it's, I'll explain it in, in my terms. So there's a masculine orine and there's a feminine orine and they're inside of me and sometimes one outweighs the other. So that's to being two spirited. And sometimes they conflict and I don't even know what's going on in there. I'm like, hey, <laughs> like stop it. <laughs> you know, like sometimes um, my partner will ask me what I think of her hair or whatever, what do I think of her makeup and it's like, birds crowing or hawking, like, like, I'm like, I have no idea. Like, that's, that's not really my thing, you know? Like, that's more of the masculine side of me. Or then, every Sunday, I watch NFL football with 20 different guys. We go to a local pub in North Vancouver, <laughs> and so, like, it's kind of balancing it out. But I'm so proud and really loud about uh, how I say I'm two-spirited. And I really love being on council because we're making so many changes. I don't know if you heard, but we just had our first rainbow crosswalk installed. So that was my um, project that I worked on with a few of the councillors. And it was, oh, thank you. <laughs> it was an amazing experience. And we had a ceremony and uh, we did an unveiling and it was just so much fun to get the community out. And we're working on relationships with uh, different uh, queer initiatives in the city. like. Um, I'm really close with the Vancouver Pride Society because we had our first float ever in the Pride Parade last year. So it's, we're getting there, we're making steps and coming a long way, but a, there's a lot of years of not being in the parade. And so just this past parade in August, I was one of the Grand Marshals. And I don't know if I can ever go to a parade again because <laughs> you just get the royal treatment. Like I was sitting on a $100,000 Audi, I had angel wings on and I brought my mom with me. And I'm just like, how is this gonna compare <laughs> to another parade? Like, I just wanna, I don't know, go around the world and be the grand marshal at every parade. That would, <laughs> that would be amazing. But it's interesting because all of the jobs that I have are very male dominated. Like with council, there's only six females out of 16. So I'm around men quite often and especially being in politics, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting one, of, one of my jobs is really interesting part. But then with DJing, it's male dominated as well. So the way we get females in the industry get treated is like we don't know what we're talking about, right? So a lot of men will talk, to me, talk down to me and be kind of condescending. But it's like, I know what I'm talking about. Like I've gone to radio broadcasting school at BCIT, you know, I've gone to DJ school. I teach DJing. So the way you're talking to me isn't right. I know, I know what I'm talking about. And, you know, I, I throw parties, like I just threw my seven year anniversary party and I'll be in meetings with these club owners and they're all guys, right? And I'm pitching an idea for a pajama party, right? And they look at me and they're like, oh, we don't know. But then they give me the, actually give me the opportunity and I show them and they're like, they're asking me to throw parties now. So it's just giving us the opportunity and including us. And one thing I'm learning about politics too is tolerating someone and including someone are completely different, right? So I try to bring that up quite a bit at the table, but it's getting better. But, and it's just, it's just inclusion. Like we just wanna be included, you know? And I'm involved with Black Lives Matters as well. I have been in the past. Uh, you know, the, one of the founders, she doesn't work for them anymore, uh, Cicely. And you know, it's interesting being a mixture of being African American, being indigenous, you know, and being two spirited. It's like, it's trying to feed, feed all of those spirits at once sometimes. Like, to be completely honest, I feel like my African American one is not being fed right now. So it, it's, I don't want to say it's conflicting, but I'm trying to find ways where I can get more involved, like going to visit my family more or just knowing what I need to do to feed that spirit, right? Or feed the masculine one or feed the feminine one. And I think we're really, the city especially, is really, really progressing. 
and more and more people in my community are coming out. I'm just such a proud feeling, you know? And if, if anyone ever drives by um, our crosswalk, you'll see it. It's amazing. <laughs> when it first got put in, I was like stalking the construction workers. <laughs> I was like peering around the corners. People were sending me pictures all day. I'm like, I'm in a meeting, stop it. But they were finally finished and I just sat with it. I didn't want to leave it like for the fear of it being vandalized or just, it's so beautiful. And just something like that is going to make people feel included, including myself and our young people. Our young people were so for it. They were like, if anyone needs one of those things, it's our members who are from the LGBTQ plus community. And that makes me so proud because the young people know. They know what's going on. Like there was a little bit of backlash, but they understand it, right? So I think I was by it for about three hours and then I finally went home. But <laughs> I drive by it every day to work just with the biggest smile on my face and it sparkles in the sunlight and I did almost crash because I was staring at it. But, <laughs> but it's just so beautiful. And um, next up, a next, another project I'm gonna be working on is gender neutral washrooms for our buildings. Um, it's, it's a bit of a slow process because you, you could probably imagine with politics, everything happens pretty slowly. Like we, uh, we did the motion back in January and then it just got put in, in October for the rainbow crosswalk. So it's, it's really interesting um, to be on council and be kind of like on the inside. I remember when I ran in the election, I don't know if anyone heard about it, it was the biggest changeover in council history since 1981. So we've got eight new councillors um, under the age of 40 and three of them are from the LGBTQ plus community. So that's never happened. And me being a mixed uh, spokesperson, I'm the first one ever, <laughs> especially being like uh, African American and indigenous, like things are changing and it's, it's really amazing to be a part of it. And BCIT was kind of like stepping stone for me and uh, just being able to get out there and, and talk in front of people. Like I'm a motivational speaker now. So I travel across North America uh, talking to youth. I'm actually going to a conference tonight called the Yes Conference. Has anyone ever heard of it? Young Entrepreneur Symposium. Uh, I was a delegate there, there seven years ago and now they invite me back every year. So it's kind of like The Apprentice. They get about maybe 200 Indigenous youth from across the country and they put them on teams and they give them business challenges. So I've gone into Yes Retirement because our team won and we always talk about it. <laughs> we got to film this amazing commercial, and uh, at the end of the week, if, if your team wins, uh, you win a huge cash prize. So we took home about $6,000. So it's really cool to, to meet the youth and just, just to hang out with them. Like, I play music. Like, that's what I get paid to do. Like, it's so much fun. And uh, just being a part, a part of their lives, a part of their journey, and just sharing what I know. Because with DJing, it's, it's almost like it's a secret, but I'm not like that. Like, I'll teach people how to DJ and they kind of come on the journey with me. Like a few of my students just played at our last show and just showing them like it's, it's attainable. And if they want to do it, um, they can and I'll show them how. And really I talk about how it's a little kind of like a selfish investment, but you take care of the younger generation, they're going to take care of you. So I tell them like when they're pushing me around in my wheelchair, when I'm old, I want it like gold, like gold weighted <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, life is really fun, uh, it's really busy. Uh, this week I'll be out in Richmond for the whole entire week. And like Micah said, I will be at uh, Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week. So if everybody could come or anyone could come, uh, you can check out their website, I believe. But I'm DJing on Wednesday night. Uh, there's a couple of designers from the Squamish Nation, uh, Pam Baker and Tyler uh, Jacobs. They're uh, showing their line. So it's, uh, it's really, fun time right now. There's lots of changes happening and it's, it's a lot of fun to be a part of it and question things and, you know, the fact that I'm just there, I think that does something. It makes people question things and think more about inclusion and uh, the way we want to go. So I just want to thank you for inviting me here. I have a lot more stories. I just kind of went through 10 years in a couple minutes. But uh, one thing I want to teach everyone here, because this is something our elders taught us, you should teach. Um, at least one thing when you speak. I'm gonna teach how to say uh, like hello, good day in Squamish. I've said it a few times. So how you say it is hot squile. Hot squile. So how, I'll explain it. Uh, when you say hot, it's spelled H-A-7-L-H. So how you pronounce the L-H is you put your tongue to the roof of your mouth and you blow. So can everyone do that? There you go. So hot 
squile. So hot means good, and squile means day. And squile also means blue, like the blue sky, so it means the day. So if you say this to a Squamish person, you're going to go up 10 points. <laughs> okay, so that's why I wanted to teach you that. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Irene. That was um, great. Thank you for sharing some of your, um, your journey. It's really appreciated. Um, it's in interesting um, being two-spirited. I grew up in a very small reserve in the Yukon, and um, a lot of our reserves and indigenous people, there's, we have a very masculine society, a part of it. We have a big warrior structure. So I was thankful that I grew up in a matriarchal society. But it wasn't until I left my hometown, I was an Aboriginal youth advocate for the National Aboriginal Friendship Center Society, and I flew all the way to Halifax, and I was there, I believe I was 18 or 17, and I already identified myself as in, uh, I guess, like, um, I would say colonizational terms as gay, but it wasn't until I went to a conference where there was like 400 or 500 indigenous people there as far as I could possibly get from home, from the Yukon, like literally on the other side of the whole country, that this two-spirited indigenous young man stood up and he was talking about his culture and him growing up and who he was an individual. And I was like really mesmerized by him and he said the word, word two-spirited and I didn't know what that meant at all. And I asked the people around me and they told me that and that was part of my journey as indigenous peoples being colonized, a lot of, a lot of, our, a lot of our stories and our culture and how we identified as in, three gender people have been taken away from us. And it took me going across the country to hear that story, to understand that term, to actually like start to re-self-identify, oh, I'm two-spirited, and to reclaim that. And as Indigenous people, we are doing that like um, over the next like years. It's gonna be phenomenal um, stories, what Orin just shared with us and all the rest of the panelists. There's like interconnectedness there, which I find is very beautiful with gender and identity, and also being two-spirited and finding out who I am as an individual. And I think BCIT is a really great resource and a really great um, foundation for that because this is the place where we learn, this is the place where we grow, and this is the place where we can question things and ask, is this correct, isn't this not correct, and kind of figure out our own path moving forward. So I really think that the panelists today were amazing. It was a very diverse, um, diverse group of people from industry, from students, from part-time students, um, from individuals who are in the entertainment industry, also politics. And for me, I work for the First Nations Health Authority, which is a pinnacle part for Indigenous people all across uh, BC. We're the first of its kind organization. But for all of us to come up here and speak and share our stories and to identify with, um, you know, um, what we're going through, I think that was pretty amazing. So I'd like to hold my hands up to Zah and all the rest of the planners for inviting us out today. Um, I know that we're gonna have a little bit more of an interactive discussion moving forward after this. Um, so if you would like to stay to be a part of that, we're gonna do table discussions at your table. Um, we'd really appreciate that. But other than that, I'd like to thank you so much for taking your time out today. And I hold my hands up to each and every one of you. You have a great day and a safe trip home. But please stay if you wanna interact a little bit more. Um, there'll be more to come. Okay, thank you.